We've now defined the derivative of a function and seen some of the things that it can tell us. We can sometimes learn even more, though, by taking the derivative of the derivative, which is called the second derivative of the function. There are different ways to denote this, including these three extensions of the notation we've already seen. We can continue considering derivatives of higher orders, too. We have the third derivative, the fourth derivative, and in general, the nth derivative. Two things to note here. First, there's no guarantee that these derivatives exist. Derivatives, like any other functions, can themselves fail to be differentiable. Also, don't confuse the notation used here for the fourth and nth derivatives with the notation for function composition. The left side, without parentheses around n, denotes function composition with n copies of f. The right side, with parentheses around n, denotes the nth derivative. In the rest of this video, we'll look in greater detail at what the second derivative can tell us. Let's start by looking at these two functions. They're different, but just looking at the sign of their derivatives doesn't tell us how, since both derivatives are positive everywhere. To see the difference more clearly, let's introduce two definitions. A function is concave up on an interval a, b, when for every two points c and d in the interval, and every x between c and d, the point x, f of x, lies below the line segment joining c, f of c, and d, f of d. Similarly, a function is concave down when x, f of x, lies above any of these lines. If you remember talking about increasing and decreasing, we defined those using secant lines. We use those to see how the first derivative can be used to show that a function is increasing or decreasing. We can do the same thing here with concavity. Suppose that f is a twice differentiable function, meaning that f prime and f double prime both exist. If f double prime is greater than zero on a, b, then f is concave up on a, b. Likewise, if f double prime is less than zero, then f is concave down. Let's go back to our example. We can draw lines indicating where the second derivatives are zero, and then label each side according to whether the second derivative is positive or negative there. Notice that the places where it's positive correspond to places where the original function is concave up, and places where it's negative correspond to places where the original function is concave down. Now look at the points on the original graphs where the vertical lines cross them. These are where the graphs change concavity, and we have a name for them. An inflection point is a point on the graph where the function changes concavity. If f double prime is defined at x, and x is an inflection point of f, then f double prime of x is 0. Knowing that f double prime of x is 0 isn't enough, though, to know that it's an inflection point. For that, we need to know that f double prime changes sign at x. Let's note again, a point at which f double prime is 0 need not be an inflection point. Second derivatives can also be used to help us categorize local extrema. Let's look at this graph. We see a local maximum here, which we determined earlier by finding a horizontal tangent line and seeing that the first derivative changes sign at that point. But now we can use concavity. This is a local maximum because the first derivative is 0 and the second derivative is negative, which means the graph is concave down. Likewise, this is a local minimum which we can verify by noting that the first derivative there is 0 and the second derivative there is positive. We can't, however, conclude anything about extrema of f from f double prime when f double prime is 0. Also, having a local maximum or minimum at a point doesn't guarantee that the second derivative is negative or positive, respectively, even for differentiable functions.